Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. My name's Dave, and I'm a collector of vintage Viewmaster reels. Each of these discs is like a time machine, taking you back to a time almost forgotten. I've been curious to visit these places and see what's there now, and to learn some history along the way. On our road trip down Route 66 from Chicago through Lincoln Land, we eventually reached St. Louis, so decided to check out the Viewmaster reel of the city. It's real SP9059, and these pictures were taken in 1951, and we found six of them. To help us find these locations, I'm using a vintage gas station map from the time. St. Louis is the second largest city in Missouri, and it sits at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. It was originally founded in 1764 by French fur traders. It was soon ceded to Spain after the Seven Years' War, and then secretly returned to France in 1800. And finally, it was sold to the U.S. as part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. It's most well known as being near the starting point of the Lewis and Clark Expedition of 1804, which set out to explore this newly acquired territory. From then and for the next hundred years, St. Louis benefited greatly from its location on the river, since the city was the northernmost navigable point at the time. By the year 1900, the population had grown to over half a million people, and when these Viewmaster pictures were taken, the population was over 850,000 people. Here's the first picture we're looking for. In Forest Park. Forest Park was easy to find, but it took some studying of the maps to find this square water feature, which led us to the World's Fair Pavilion, which memorializes one of the most influential events in St. Louis history. Forest Park was the site of the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, properly known as the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, since it celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. Ten years earlier, the city of Chicago had held the World's Columbian Exposition, celebrating Columbus's arrival in the New World, which was a great success and extremely influential. These World's Fairs were kind of like if you built Disney World as an attraction, but only kept it open for six months and then tore it all down. The Chicago World's Fair had introduced the idea of City Beautiful, an idealized philosophy of city design intended to promote social order and increase the quality of life. Part of this philosophy meant building large-scale monuments and public spaces within a well-planned city. St. Louis took this idea even further as they built their World's Fair buildings into the existing Forest Park area, creating a master-planned temporary city, clean, electrified, free of poverty, with parks, monuments, and public transport, all of which contrasted greatly with the real city of St. Louis at the time, which was smoke-filled, dirty, and crowded. The comparison to Disney World continues. Walt Disney's experimental prototype community of tomorrow, Epcot, is basically a modern, permanent World's Fair. Both Epcot and the St. Louis World's Fair were built from master design plans which surrounded a central lagoon. They both focused on public transportation. The St. Louis World's Fair built new streetcar lines to access the fair and added 75 miles of roads and walkways into Forest Park. They had a miniature railway and even little roller chairs where college students would push you around on a guided tour. One whole half of Epcot Center is the World Showcase, which shows different countries from around the world, including people working there who are actually from those countries. The St. Louis World's Fair had an equivalent, the Foreign Nation Exhibits. These showed off hundreds of people from other places in their way of life, like Native Americans, Alaskan tribes, people from Japan and Asia, and the newly acquired Philippine territories. The fair demonstrated new inventions, with corporate exhibits showing off the latest technology. Things like a wireless telephone, the teleautograph, which was an early fax machine, the x-ray machine, the electric streetcar, personal automobiles, and hundreds of other things. 
But maybe most important for the visiting public was the food and entertainment. The fair had moving pictures, nightly illuminations, food courts, shows, rides, and even the original Ferris wheel that had been purchased from Chicago and moved to St. Louis. In these days before the internet, the World's Fair was a -a once-in-a-lifetime eye-opening experience to be remembered. The Viewmaster picture is of the World's Fair Pavilion, which was built in 1909, six years after the fair, and it's on the original location of the Missouri State Exhibit Building, and the water features were added in the 1930s. We drove a while through Forest Park and found the only original World's Fair building remaining, which was the Palace of Fine Arts. It's now the St. Louis Art Museum. During the fair, it contained priceless works of art, so it was built to be a permanent building, and it still overlooks a grand basin of water. Forest Park is really beautiful. It contains several museums, lakes, a golf course, and a world-famous zoo that we didn't have time to see. The St. Louis World's Fair seems like it would have been a really amazing experience, but one concept from it is really important. The influence of the City Beautiful movement on the development of St. Louis, as we'll see with our next stop. St. Louis and the Mississippi River. Here's a scene that's changed dramatically in the last 62 years, and I think it shows the extent the city was willing to go to to fulfill the city beautiful idea. Just finding this location shows how much St. Louis has changed. You can see that the Viewmaster picture was taken from a more southerly angle than mine, so I really wanted to figure out where that was. I thought at first it must have been taken from the Poplar Street Bridge, but that bridge wasn't built until 1967, well after the Viewmaster picture was taken. But in 1951, the MacArthur Street Bridge was open to street traffic. It carried the local Route 66 through the city, so the picture must have been taken from there. Today, that bridge only carries rail traffic. We ended up finding a park across the river, which has a viewing point of St. Louis, and we took our picture from there. These two tallest buildings in the picture still exist. This one's the Civil Courts Building, which we'll see later, and this one's the Southwestern Bell Building, now the AT&T Building. But what I didn't know is something that's missing from the picture now. Over here was St. Louis's Chinatown, which was formed in 1896. It was entirely demolished in 1966 to make way for Bush Stadium. And over here, if you look carefully, is a giant 40 square block parking lot. But in our old maps and photos, this was a thriving area of businesses. So I wondered what happened to them. Well, the other difference between these pictures is what happened. The St. Louis Arch, or what was originally named the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, The story of the arch shows how much the city was willing to change to become city beautiful. Thirty years after the World's Fair, it was the Great Depression, and civic leader Luther Eli Smith thought that building a great memorial on the St. Louis Riverfront would revive the economy and bring new jobs. This levee area by the river was the heart of St. Louis. Some of the oldest buildings still stood there, but this area was considered a slum, and now it was the target of this new City Beautiful project. To prepare for their new monument, the city had the levee area demolished, and this was done well before the design of the monument had even been decided. But when World War II began, their funding ended, and the city converted the entire empty area into a parking lot with no specific plans as to what to build there. After the war, in 1947, the city held a competition looking for ideas for the memorial, and in 1948, Eero Saarinen's arch design was chosen. However, since they'd selected such a large area of the city, major changes to the railroad infrastructure had to be completed before any monument construction could begin, and the arch itself wasn't finished until 1968, which was 35 years after the original idea was proposed. 
When we visited the site, it really was a stunning monument, although I didn't even realize when we were there that it was a monument to Jefferson and the westward expansion. And from that little park across the river, it really does frame the city's skyline beautifully, very in line with the design aesthetic of the World's Fairs. It made me wonder, though, how many residents realized how much architectural history was removed in order to build that arch. Today, the only original building remaining was our next stop, the historic Old Catholic Cathedral. When this Viewmaster picture was taken, the destruction of the levee was complete, but this Catholic church and its rectory were too important to remove, and it remains as the only original building on the site. It's just over here, in an area carved out of the National Park. The land it's on was assigned to be a church just after the city's founding in 1766, and it was originally a tent. That was replaced by a log house and then a brick structure in 1818. The current structure replaced that in 1834. It's been an active Catholic church for a couple hundred years, and what I find interesting is how church activity continued as all the buildings around it were demolished. Creating great public monuments is a core tenet of the city beautiful ideology, but in this case, was it used as an excuse to remove what some considered a blight on the city? Our next goal was just a couple blocks from the arch. It's the anchor to a series of urban developments that really mimic the World's Fair designs. The Old Courthouse The old courthouse is now on the grounds of the Gateway Arch National Park, so it was just a short walk away. The courthouse was donated in 1816 by one of the city's founders and a local judge. The current building was completed in 1839, and it was designed by the same architect who designed the old cathedral. The cupola on top of the building was based on St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, which is a very popular Viewmaster subject. The old courthouse is where the initial trials of the Dred Scott case were heard, which eventually went to the Supreme Court, and their decision hastened the coming of the U.S. Civil War. It was abandoned as a courthouse in 1930, becoming part of the Gateway Park in 1940. Today, it contains several museums, but it was closed for refurbishment when we visited, so we continued into town to our next destination. Memorial Plaza Just a few blocks further into town, we came to this memorial. It's just outside the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. The curved pillar here is in the World War II Memorial Court, which was built in 1945 by Hillis Arnold. This building here is the Civil Courts Building, which replaced the old courthouse. It was designed as part of an $87 million project in 1923 to continue the City Beautiful plan by building monuments and memorials downtown along what would become known as the Gateway Mall. Its pyramid roof is made to resemble the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, which is one of the seven wonders of the world and another very popular Viewmaster topic. Walking through the plazas, we pass several World's Fair-style monumental buildings and public parks, many of which were built in the 20s, but many of which have been built since then, as the city continues to fulfill its vision. These buildings we passed were very impressive, but we soon realized that things were much further apart than we originally thought. But we pushed on to our next stop. Miles Fountain in Allo Plaza
At the end of the Gateway Mall is this fantastic fountain, but like Buckingham Fountain in Chicago, the water wasn't running. It's right outside the St. Louis Union Station, and it's a full 20-block walk across town from the Arch to here. Every couple blocks we walked, there was a differently named plaza, and this final one is Allo Plaza, named after Louis P. Allo, who led that original City Beautiful movement in the 20s that started all this development. The fountain was commissioned by Allo's widow, Edith, and was called Wedding of the Waters. It was created by Carl Miles and symbolizes the meeting of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. But due to the statue's nakedness, the city renamed it the Meeting of the Waters. You can see in the Viewmaster picture, this is the 18th Street parking garage, which still exists today. But the Princess Hotel was in the way of progress and was demolished in the 1950s. In fact, each section of the mall was completed over the years, removing more and more of the original downtown buildings. Next to the plaza is Union Station, which opened in 1894 and was the largest train station in the world at the time, but rail service ceased in 1978. The building survived demolition, though, because it's been listed as a National Historic Landmark. Today, it's an entertainment complex with restaurants, shops, an aquarium, and even a connection to the original World's Fair with a giant Ferris wheel. This was our last stop, so we wandered through Union Station, got something to eat, and took a rest. Then we realized our car was parked all the way back at the beginning, so we got up to start the long hike back to the arch. The monuments and plazas of St. Louis were very impressive and made our walk very pleasant, but I wonder what the cost of City Beautiful really is. Is the Gateway Arch worth the loss of so many historic buildings? Will future generations love the monument and not be concerned with what was lost to build it? Or, if the monument had not been built and the levee neighborhood remained, could developers find uses for so many old buildings today, or would they all be abandoned? Union Station seems like an example of a historic building that's still serving a purpose today. But could all of the levee buildings have found modern uses? I think probably not. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed our visit to St. Louis, and thanks for watching.